Okay. The time is 4.05. We're going to call the meeting to order. Is it still not working? Testing. Better? Hello? Hi, who's on the line? Uh, this is Phil. Okay, hi, Phil. Excuse me, Director Cernanic. <laughs> All right, so uh, agenda item two is the summary of the May 4th, 2016 board work session. Is there any corrections, additions, deletions, anything incorrect? Director Chular. Um, Mike, Mike, please. Oh, okay. okay, we'll add that. I know, but okay. When we became a session. Ah, uh, I guess since we're not the invit committee anymore, we're a work session. We do take roll. So, Connie. Eva Henry. Here. Bill Holan. Nancy Sharp. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Tim Mock. Chrissy Fanganello. Anthony Graves. Here. Robin Kneech. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Don Rozier. Libby Zabo. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Larry Vidham. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Here. Ann Justin. Lynn Baca. Rex Bell. George Teal. Paul Donahue. Doris Trular. Here. Ron Engels. Catherine Hyder. Laura Christman, Alex Brown, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Carl Randolph, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, John Hamlin, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Here. Sarah Karis Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, TJ Gordon, Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Sardanic. Present. Jackie Millay, Joan Peck, Gabe Santos, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, Richard Kramer, Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Deborah Williams, Adam Matkowski, Eric Montoya, Herb Atchison, Emma Pinter, Joyce J. We don't need a quorum. All right. All right, next item is agenda item four, which is public comment. Uh, we request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board of directors. Please note the public will have an opportunity to speak on specific items in the Metro Vision plan between the staff presentation and committee discussion. Do we have anybody here to address the board today? Seeing nobody, we'll move on to agenda item five, which is attachment B. And I want to point out that although uh, we certainly don't discourage uh, conversation and continue dialogue on this, that this is the eight recommended performance measures and associated targets that MVIC are, has already spent the previous iteration of this group has already spent months going over. Um, so hopefully we don't have a lot of um, regurgitation, but if we do, we do, I guess. So I'm going to turn it over to Brad Calvert. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so as the chair mentioned, this is a bit of a, of a rehash uh, of some work that MVIC did 
in the April to June time frame uh, last year. And so I'm going to have a quick presentation. I'm going to give you a, a little bit of background, recognizing that in some ways we're giving you a little bit of information overload for what we think is a very simple item. But again, there are people that, have, that are around the table today that weren't around the table uh, a year or so ago, so just bear with me if you if you if this all sounds like something you've he you've heard uh, before. So, um, as noted as the, in the memo, and the, and the chair mentioned, uh, Invic recommended a series of, of performance measures for the Metro Vision Plan uh, back in June of, of last year. Uh, there were there were eight measures that were recommended by Invic um, at the time. Those those did not um, ultimately make their way all the way to the board. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and I'm going to sort of use this visual to show you the primary reason as to why we're now kind of circling back. Um, at that time, we started with a measures conversation, and I think we realized after the measures conversation that this group really needed some context first. So we, we went back up kind of the, the altitude of, of the Dr. Dr. Cox strategic planning model and revisited or started the conversation with overarching themes and outcomes and obviously have worked our way uh, through those. So, for instance, the board uh, approved a series of overarching themes and outcomes in January, uh, and, in, and in May they, they approved a set of objectives, including, including narratives. So it just felt like now was the right time uh, to come back and, and revisit the measures that, that Invic previously uh, discussed again about this time uh, last year. Um, attachment two in your packet is sort of that contextual piece that shows you Every, all actions to date that the board has taken related to uh, what's in the strategic planning model and obviously kind of how that ultimately ties its, ties its way back uh, to Invic as well. So now I'll, I'll quickly kind of run through this presentation, which is um, also in your packet. Uh, you clearly have heard over and over, either, either from me via Jerry or via Jerry through me or any way you want to think about it, about sort of the strategic, strategic uh, planning approach that we're taking here at Dr. Cog. So I shouldn't have to really spend a lot of time telling you and, or convincing you that measurement is really important to that. Um, but just a, a few quick uh, reminders uh, about sort of the ground that's been covered so far. Uh, as, you, as, as noted in the, in the, um, in the memo, uh, there were eight uh, measures uh, recommended by Envic uh, this time last year. And just so, so that everyone knows, five of those were actually carryovers from the MetroVision 2035 plan, right? So we are building on kind of a performance management framework that, we, that the board started uh, the last time uh, you adopted a plan, um, in this case back in 2011. Some of those got tweaks in terms of what the target looks like or how they're being measured, but really, again, building on that foundation that had previously uh, been laid. Um, and the other thing to just keep in mind, very important, is these are regional performance measures. These are not local performance measures. These are, as a region, how are we doing on the things that we have said are important to us at the regional scale. So that, that's also something uh, important to keep in mind. Uh, the other reminder that I think is probably important for uh, maybe the, uh, the newer folks to, to know is you know, there is no mandate um, in terms of what this plan looks like that says it has to have measures and that it has to have measures and targets. But because we really are doing our best to, to hold true to that strategic planning model, which is something that is really critical um, in that line of thinking, that's really where um, a fair amount of this came, came from, even though, as I mentioned, um, you know, a lot of this was ultimately building on a foundation that was, that was laid uh, previously. You know, this, this is about understanding collective impact. Uh, what we as Dr. Cog, you as your, and at the, and the local government level, our key partners and stakeholders, what everyone is working toward and how we can measure um, progress to those outcomes and objectives that the board has stated are important for the region uh, going forward. Uh, a quick kind of reflection on something this group talked about last month, which I think is also a good context, is uh, last month we spent a few minutes talking about sort of the preamble uh, the intro to the MetroVision plan that really kind of lays out what it is and what it isn't, um, kind of what the limitations are, that sort of thing. And there's a fair amount of that that I think really ties into the measures conversation and this piece, this, these six principles that have really been around for a decade or more. You know, when we think of measures, we think of at least two of these boxes for sure. We think of them as being aspirational, long range, and regional in focus. That's really key. And then the other thing that we think about is the, the, the bottom right box, that the plan should remain dynamic and flexible. And in some ways, that's the point of continuous measurement so that we can constantly check in on our progress and, and readjust, reevaluate, um, if needed, kind of the policy framework uh, that the board uh, has laid out. 
So this violates probably all PowerPoint rules, lots of words on the slide, and so I will not read them to you, but this is also from the preamble, and it's just three ways of kind of saying the same thing over and over again. Regional measures. This is about regional measures. The MetroVision has always recognized that the way that local, um, our local partners contribute to this plan is going to vary by place. We do not anticipate that everyone is going to hit the same measure in the same way. You are simply contributing to, hopefully, a regional measure. This is not about kind of measuring what's happening um, at the local level. This is regional uh, measurement. So getting to kind of the heart of the matter for the item that's, that's in front of you, these, and they're in the memo as well, these are the eight um, performance measures that were, that were recommended by ENVIC um, back in June of, of last year. And really we're bringing this before you because we kind of wanted to remind people of this because we ultimately are going to bundle it up and, and take it to the board. And then in thinking through this, staff did have one minor uh, change that we would like to see, and hopefully um, you agree, and that's on, uh, on Measure 7, uh, that as recommended by ENVIC was um, kind of on the transportation side of things, uh, was a measure of person delay per trip. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're suggesting. We have an alternative that we're, that we're um, hoping you will also uh, endorse, and that's daily person delay per capita. Now, I know they sound like the exact same thing, but they, they are um, slightly different. And the reasons uh, as to why we are making this recommendation are laid out in the memo and they're on the slide as well. But just to quickly kind of hit the highlights as to why we think the substitute uh, makes some sense. Uh, the previous measure that was recommended by um, ENVIC is based on model data. We use our travel model to come up with that. And there are a variety of issues that come with that. Number one, it's modeled versus observed. Uh, the measure that we're suggesting is actually observed and it's something that we do um, each year as part of our, our con congestion mitigation. Uh, program, so it's something that again is observed. We know it's available annual, annually. Um, one of the things that we struggle with model data. So, for instance, this is the year 2016, um, and our model we may have a base year of 2015. That base year is going to remain the base year for four, five, six years, right, until we get to a new base year, because we really are only modeling in five-year increments. So. If we were to keep that MVIC measure, we would always be reporting back to you a 2015 figure, and you wouldn't actually see, if the needle was moving, you wouldn't see it. And if you were to see changes, it would likely be due to changes in the way that, that the model um, is working. So we really feel like um, ultimately observed data that we know we can produce um, annually is kind of um, the way to go. And then obviously with, with each measure that MVIC recommended, uh, we had a, an associated target. So throwing something out there for, for you to discuss, um, the current baseline on this measure is um, uh, six minutes of daily uh, person uh, delay per capita. Much like the other congestion measure that is, that is in the draft plan, we're, we're really sort of suggesting we hope it gets less worse. Um, so unlike beating where we are today, we're simply we're, we're trying to beat where our current forecast and estimate is. So that congestion uh, mitigation program that I mentioned forecast that by the year 2040, we'll be at approximately 10 minutes of daily uh, person delay per capita. And so our target that we're putting in front of you for discussion is that we would say that we will be less than that currently uh, forecasted um, uh, figure. And Mr. Chair, that's it for the presentation. Other than that, the memo does mention a few uh, next steps. Um, and just to kind of quickly hit the highlights, um, hopefully, you know, we'll work through this session and make some progress on the overall plan performance measures. Uh, we will continue to roll things up uh, and take them to the board. Uh, the two remaining items, if you remember from that green uh, pyramid that you saw earlier, measurement and then strategic initiatives. So you're, we are on the tail end of this. Uh, and so the hope is that we will get through um, uh, measures with this group and then obviously take it to the full board uh, as well and then come back with strategic initiatives. And then fingers crossed up here, uh, we hit a public review draft and maybe the August time frame. Uh, with board uh, consideration and hopefully adoption uh, by the end of the year. And so that's it for the presentation. So comments, questions, concerns on the change? I'd like to start with just the uh, staff suggested revision for item seven. I saw Director Malay. I'm very supportive of the staff's recommendation, but I, I would like to go back to the preamble if the, if the chair would allow me to, because sure. there's language that I, I think I've said that I can remember at least four times that I still am not seeing in the preamble, and I'm hopeful that maybe I, I'm not sure what I need to do to phrase it differently, but I really think it's important to note in the preamble that the success of MetroVision will depend on the actions of many others, other partners, regional partners beyond the Dr. Cog board. And I know you talk around it a lot. I would actually like to see that language specifically in there and wondering if 
there's head nods of support from the people at this table to see that that specific la language that the success depends on our region on, on us and our regional partners including and and I leave that to staff to, to put in but I uh, but I, I so can I get you know how do I do that in this session head nods yeah. who hate whoever hates the idea raise your hand um, mr. Culvert what uh, what you, what's in this slide was obviously just a few excerpts. Uh, we actually revisited the preamble today um, as staff, including looking back at the notes from the last conversation. And trust me, I, I don't have it to show you, but in big highlights, the, your words, just as you said it, are in there that when, we, when you see the next version, the, and, and we are big believers in this, this is, this is the board's plan, um, but the, the board's plan can only be successful with the action of, of many, many actors around the region, local government, stakeholders, all sorts of folks. So. Director I, I, I can guarantee you when you see it come back to you, you're, it, it will be I, in there. I keep thinking I'm going to see it at these meetings, and I haven't seen it yet, so thank you very much for that. Um, if, if I may be indulged to ask, um, how many of you folks at this table were here a year ago when we talked about these? If, if you were here, please raise your hand. Can we get a sense of, is it half of us or a little more than half of us? Let's see, three more, quarters. That, which is good. So, Jennifer indicated early in the executive officer meeting that 34% of the board has turned over since last year. So, is that, did I say it wrong? 31. Sorry. 31. I see, look at me exaggerating. I'll tell you how tall I am soon. 31% <laughs> of the, I forgot a whole person potentially. So, or, or I'm deaf. I wrote 34 down when she said it, so maybe it was my thinking. But anyway, I guess my point is that a lot of the people that may be voting on this are not as familiar with the targets and how they were established. And I appreciate the confidence that you may or may not be showing in, in the folks that were here a year ago. But is there a source of information? Because um, Winshaw, who's my alternate, asked me today, you know, well, gee, how did you come up with those targets? Are you sure about those numbers? And I know we certainly had those conversations a year ago. Is there a summary document that we could circulate to some of the folks who weren't here that they could have an understanding that we did spend time deciding whether or not we, not, we thought these were realistic? And I think the consensus was that, that, you know, yes, some of them are aspirational, but we can do it. So does that exist in one place for folks? Sure. Uh, the, the memo actually included a link um, that takes you to a, a fair amount of background information. I mean, one of the things that, that, that MVIC at the time asked staff to do was to give you as much background baseline trend information that, that would give you that comfort, right? So the link has some of that, but we can certainly, with that very specific direction, take, take, a, take a closer look that, particularly as this goes to the board, um, the board can see as much of sort of the background that went into the conversation and the decision uh, as possible. I think it would be helpful if you, and productive, frankly. Director Brockett. Thank you. I have a question about the, the revision that's being proposed. I do uh, support the revision, um, but I did have a question about, and pardon me if this was addressed last year when I wasn't here, but the delay per capita, is that being calculated using all the modes of transportation that are used in the metro area, or is that strictly a, a driving car-oriented metric? I pretty much know the answer, but I've learned standing here with this stuff, I'm going to uh, call on a lifeline for people that are much closer <laughs> to this so that you get the absolute 100% uh, correct answer. It looks like, so it looks like Jacob is ready to go on this one. Mr. Reed. Right. So this is phone a friend. Um, the short answer is that Either way that it's calculated, whether we try and pull it from the model or we do it the way that we're actually recommending through observed traffic counts, we can't capture every single mode, um, particularly bike and ped, because it's hard to measure like walk delay or bike delay. But the advantage of doing it this way is that we are capturing everything on our major roadways, uh, most of the travel in the region, and it's something that's observed that we can do every single year. So this is kind of our best uh, way to get at this, though it's imperfect. Great. And th that certainly makes sense on like bike and ped, but I mean, are there uh, delay numbers, say for RTD, could you factor in the percentage of people riding the light rail and what the average delay is, something like that? Phone a friend, phone a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it's something we could look into now to the extent that, um, you know, buses are on the roadway system, you know, those should be showing up in, in those calculations. Um, the light rail obviously would be a separate thing. It's something we could look at. I, I won't promise how easy it would be, but it's something we can, we can look at. Okay. Just, thanks. Something to think about. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Brad, again, and, and gentlemen, uh, just to take it uh, a little deeper down the rabbit hole, 
it does sound to me like this is um, you did say that the proposal this is being proposed because the six minutes uh, is observed can you give us a little more detail uh, is this a multi-year observation and the six minutes is the mean of uh, what we're seeing over multiple years was this just the last year can you help me out with that Brad Sure. So six, correct, six minutes is for 2014, right? So the last year of observed data was 2014, and so that's the, the current figure that you're seeing. Correct. And the 10 minutes is the 2040, so we do, just like in our other transportation work, we look at our existing baseline and our horizon year forecast. So the 10 minutes is 2040. What we're saying is can we, can we beat our own forecast? Can we do better? Can we make it less worse than the forecast is already projected to be? Does that make sense? You bet. And I'd like to speak in favor of uh, staff recommendation here. Um, I, I appreciate going from model data to observed data. I think that's a real, um, that's something I can justify to the people who elected me. So uh, I think that's a positive uh, suggestion. Yeah, this is based on traffic counts. So every year when we, when we collect traffic counts from, from our partners throughout the region, all of your communities and CDOT, we use those traffic counts in our congestion mitigation program and that feeds the data that eventually outputs these numbers. So every year we can update that analysis. Cool, thanks. So once again at this work session we do not take votes but I am just going to ask are we generally comfortable with this moving forward with the staff's recommendation? I uh, don't see anybody jumping up and down so I'm going to assume. Mr. 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 Chair, I'd like, just like a quick comment. I'm like, where, where's that voice coming from? <laughs> Director Cernanic. Thank you, Bob. Uh, <laughs> Brad, uh, on the comment that uh, you did use as an excerpt uh, that talked about individual communities progressing at their own pace, uh, what you might do to underline uh, Director Malay's uh, comments is talk about not just individual communities, but individual communities and partners will be proceeding at their own pace. Got it. Other comments? Okay, then we are going to consider the uh, overall eight performance measures. Is there further? So I want to open it up for discussion uh, the people might have on this. Director Jones. I was just going to wax poetic about all of the, the good times we had in MVIC a year ago, slogging through each one of these, dot voting, just getting a little nostalgic. And um, I do want to put in a plug for the um, painstaking work that we did. And um, I, I feel like we've, we arrived in a good place. We, we compromised. We scrubbed them. And so I feel pretty good about their work, and I'd be enthusiastic about forwarding them again to the full board. All right. I will point out that the MVIC chair from last year was deeded the work session chair for this year, so uh, hopefully we don't go through a lot of pain that we did last year. No. Um, I'm not seeing anybody that wants to wax poetic further, so I'm going to assume that we're going to move this forward. All right, very good. We are on to agenda item six, attachment C. Mr. Calvert. So if anyone wants to relive that experience of talking about measures for about an hour and a half, it's about to happen. So. You, we can all share that joy um, now. So uh, this next item really kind of is a carryover uh, from that conversation, as was noted uh, about this time last year. Um, Invic spent a fair amount of time on um, eight overall planned performance measures. And really what we're suggesting um, through this uh, agenda item is we want to, first of all, revisit two items that Invic talked about a lot, um, but we're, we're never really able to reach consensus. Um, and so in the memo, those are referred to as measures A and B. Um, if, I, if I call something A or B, just know that we used numbers the first time, and now we're using letters, so hopefully that'll, that'll keep you straight. Um, both of these items were, were items that were discussed, again, at length. Um, there is an attachment that talks a little bit of sort of, a, the, of the, how that discussion went and various things that Invit considered during the conversation, but at the end of the day, 
Um, when, when the June meeting came last year, they just weren't quite able to, to come to consensus about what a recommendation would be. But again, they were talked about a lot, so we didn't feel like they should just go away. It made sense for them to come back. Um, and so obviously we want to have um, that conversation with you all. And then um, at thinking about that as we were bringing these back, we thought there might be some other uh, measures, including uh, targets that, w that might um, warrant a, further co or a first time conversation uh, with you all as well. Um, and so we'll talk about those. So I'll hit these first two um, um, quickly, sort of A and B. Um, the two measures are um, sort of share of uh, the region's housing of households that are cost burdened. And then there's also a measure related to housing plus transportation costs, right? Do people, are people living in areas that allow them to um, afford both housing and transportation because there's, there's oftentimes a trade-off uh, between those two things. Um, again, Invic spent a fair amount of time on these. Um, you'll note that staff has a recommendation uh, to move forward with, with the cost burdened households. And I will just be straight with you about why that staff recommendation came and that is because of data availability and the fact that we know that data is going to come out every single year. It, it was a feasibility recommendation. I would not suggest that the H plus T is coming without a recommendation or something that we're opposed to. It's just one of those things that um, in the past decade that data has come out three or four times and we really are hopeful that as we report out to you on progress we can give you an annual progress report and you can see change over time and so that's really what that's about. Staff is very much um, supportive of, of H plus T as a, as, as a measure that, that talks about um, the affordability of place and location. It really came down to we can't be sure that we're going to see it every single year. So we actually reached out um, prior to this, um, prior to this evening, to sort of ask the, H, the Center for Neighborhood Technology folks, the people that produce the H plus T, kind of what their release schedule was. And right now they're anticipating hopefully every two years is when they would release this data, but it's dependent on funding. Like they don't, they don't have a consistent and constant funding stream where they know every year we can release this or even every other year. So that's, that's kind of where staff is in terms of making a recommendation of one over the other as far as I'm concerned. When this group has a conversation, you can advance them both and staff would have zero heartburn about that. We just kind of gave you the caveat as to why um, they, the H plus T was something that we just, we couldn't necessarily advance as a recommendation. It really was about um, measure feasibility. Uh, so quickly kind of walking you through the other four, um, uh, C through F, uh, I think they're all pretty straightforward. So um, measure C as suggested by staff is just simple um, employment in the region. Uh, we have a forecast that says that we are going to hit uh, 2.6 million jobs in this region in the year 2040. That's a big economic driver. So we should try to stay on track with that forecast, right? We, sh we should do our best to hit that number. So that that's, and obviously that's connected to uh, many other um, things um, in the view in the form of outcomes and objectives uh, that the board has already um, said were important. Uh, measure D is about sort of the amount of protected open space that we have uh, in the Denver region. Uh, this has been sort of the open space network and its value to our region has been something that has been in the plan uh, really since the very first plan, Metro Vision 2020. Uh, we've had measurable goals or targets associated with that since the late 90s. Um, so we, we, we are suggesting to kind of carry that forward. Um, the background material that's provided to you sort of talks a little bit about how that measure has changed over time. We can get into that if that's important for you to, to feel like you want to talk about um, as you consider this, but I'll, I'll skip it for now. Um, measure E is something that uh, is very much a complement to a previously uh, endorsed measure that we just talked about um, that's the percentage of population and employment in urban centers. When we were talking about that measure with the MetroVision Planning Advisory Committee now two and a half years ago, give or take, uh, they really saw this measure as a complement to that. Like, let's not just think about designated urban centers, let's also think about areas in our region that are served by transit um, so that we get a little bit more coverage in thinking about how we want to, to use that as a growth framework for our region. So we went, given how strongly um, MVPAC supported that, we brought that back uh, for your consideration. Uh, and then the other one was because we've spent a fair amount of time talking about resiliency and how it can be incorporated in the plan, um, we have a Measure F that we're presenting. The, when you think about sort of measuring the impact of, of, of hazards and, and disasters, the risks, the effects side is really tough because every year they change, I mean, you get different types of, of, of events uh, in different places. And so measuring effects year over year is, is 
probably a little difficult to do. Um, you just, you'll see a lot of noise in that. So we decided maybe think more on the risk side of this. And it really was about what, we, what we're putting forward is, is measuring uh, the share of the region's housing and employment in those high-risk areas. So these are places that would potentially be impacted, uh, both households and um, uh, 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 job centers, uh, by hazards um, in those areas. And so we were really talking about actually taking that, that share of population and employment in those areas now and actually um, lowering that um, as the plan uh, proceeds uh, to the year 2040. So that's kind of the background on the, on the six um, that you have in front of you. Um, I'll uh, defer to the chair in terms of how he wants to uh, run the conversation. I could see that we might want to talk about A and B yes. uh, first, since uh, obviously the group spent a fair amount of time with, on that um, about a year ago. And that is where I was going to go, is to recommend that we do A and B. Uh, as you can see again, and as Mr. Calvert mentioned, the staff recommends measurement A, uh, but does not have heartburn if we move forward with either or both. So conversation about A and B. Excuse me, before I do that, I did promise um, an opportunity for public invited to be heard prior to our conversation. So on these A through F, is there any, anybody in the audience that would like to address the board? Seeing nobody, I'll go back to A and B, I'll open the floor for conversation. Director Holan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am, um, have been a very strong advocate over the last several years on the issue of, of adequate low income and affordable housing for our, for our citizens. Arapahoe County right now is facing a crisis, and I know Aurora is about to face additional uh, strains in, in providing affordable housing to your citizens. Um, and I just think that this, uh, and I'm speaking in, in favor of A, uh, simply because I think uh, all those uh, ancillary issues that we're dealing with tend to have a, a, uh, a, a focus on uh, housing. Housing is the first step for everything, whether it's transportation, whether it's, whether it's uh, health care, whether it's uh, employment. And if, if we don't have affordable housing and people with, with middle incomes, and, and, and frankly, if you look at the rise in, in, in rental uh, costs in the last two years, uh, we're forcing many, many of the lower income people out of their apartments uh, into, uh, in some cases, homelessness, in some cases, in, uh, inadequate uh, housing, like in the case of, of uh, uh, in Arapahoe County, many, many families along the Colfax corridor in particular are living in hotels that are substandard. So I'm a strong advocate of, of increasing this percentage, uh, but if, if I can, we can't find support for that, I certainly would, would uh, consider A as being the primary goal of, uh, of these uh, recommendations. Okay, so right now in the queue, I have uh, Director Teal, then Director Kanich. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would actually ask us to consider passing on both A and B. And I realize that we all do have concerns about, um, you know, the, the cost of housing in our region. We are actually um, a, a rapidly growing region. We're a region that is seeing the cost of housing going up. It's hard to turn on the television and not see that on the evening news. The only problem, the reason why I'd ask for us to pass on both, and um, just, just to address uh, item A to begin with, what we are finding in Castle Rock is nearly half the cost of a new home is associated with the, uh, the preparation of the land. Preparation of the land, preparation of the lot, that is actually being mandated by our very own codes. The engineering we require, because I'm sure like many communities, Castle Rock is a wonderful place where uh, crops really don't grow. We grow, we're really good at growing horses and we're really good at growing cows, mostly because we have expansion soil beneath that grass. And it's soil that does not support, without some, you know, good engineering, building a home upon. And so more and more we find, as we look at this, really the more the government intervenes, the more the municipal government, Castle Rock intervenes, the more the prices actually go up. 
they don't go down, despite our best efforts to provide affordable housing um, to anybody who would like to live in the wonderful place called Castle Rock. There's a brochure out there that says that, by the way. So I would ask us that we, we pass, we pass on it, um, just from the perspective that we're encouraging our member communities to make this a part of their zoning process, make this a part of their land use planning. And I would encourage us to pass because it is more involvement in that land use planning that we may have hit a tipping point, folks. Yes, we're doing everything we can to build safe homes. Yes, we're doing everything we can to build, uh, to, to protect the rights of the current landowners who would wish to develop that land. But the more we meddle, the more the actual prices do go up. As an aside, I would also, um, also like to speak against adopting B um, for a very different reason. Um, actually, a lot of the same reasons, but my reason I'd like to uh, point out is something that Brad said of the H&T calculation, it's proprietary information. We don't know that that's going to be information we're going to have at our disposal moving forward. It is something that could disappear and something we would not be able to measure as we do close in on 2040 and the intervening years in between. So. Um, Definitely, I think we should follow staff advice, not adopt B, but also I'd encourage everyone, consider uh, passing on adopting A. I just, again, the, the lessons learned in Castle Rock is the more we all intervene, the more our desired outcome seems to elude us. Okay, in the queue I have Director Kanich, then Stolzman, and then Graves. Director Kanich. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so to, to recap a little bit, uh, last year when this um, issue came up, I was a strong proponent for both measures. And I thought, because they get at slightly different things. The first one really gets at your deepest, lowest income families. The other one really gets at the broader um, affordability and has more ways to impact. And I'd still be very comfortable with that, but I want us to shortchange, right, as much debate as we had last time. So I am, I am looking for some, you know, ways where we can maybe get to common ground more quickly. And so I can definitely live with um, having just one measure on this really important topic. I think having a measure is important. Um, in part, I think if you compare where we are today to where we were a year ago, I don't know about you all, but like this is now on my employer's radar. Last year, it was advocates for you know, low income housing and it was you know, kind of the advocates for the poor that were most passionate. Now this is really a topic at all the business tables. Um, you, know, you can't go anywhere without Tom Clark talking about the threat that affordability poses to recruiting new employers. And so, so I feel like it's important for our region to have a measure that we are tracking because it sends the message that we take that seriously to our business community. So, so that, that's kind of my, my way of saying I think it's important to have a measure. I'm happy to just have one if that feels more comfortable to this body. Um, to speak to the specifics, um, I, I think one interesting benefit to Measure B, um, a, couple, a couple things. It's been adopted by communities in 23 states, including like the entire Ohio Department of Transportation uses this measure. It's, it's newer, but it's not fly by night. It's definitely um, entrenched. A number of council of governments are using it. Um, and so, so I think that that's, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely taken root in a number of places. We would not be by any, any, any stretch the first community to adopt it. The other thing is I think we pay for other data sets, yes? We don't, I mean, much of our data is not free. So I think it's a little weird to call this one out. I mean, we pay for data. Sometimes you can get it from the census and it's free, great. Sometimes we pay for census data because someone else does something to it and we like that. But it's not uncommon for us to, to, to pay for data. So I, I hope that's not too much of a barrier. Um, and then the last thing on the H plus T that I think is really interesting, if you're thinking about, gosh, I don't want my community being put on the spot for something that's hard to impact, the measure B is actually gives your community or our region more ways to impact it, right? So you could impact it by lowering the cost of building new housing because it would impact all incomes. You could impact it by lowering the cost of transportation, right? You know, you know, whether it's you know, more accessible to transportation, whether it's subsidized transportation, whether it's just the proximity of transportation. So there are so many more ways to impact those two numbers. If we go with measure A, 
the only way to really impact it is to provide low-income housing because that's who you're, you're dealing with in Measure A, and believe me, I'm totally in favor of that. <laughs> and if this body wanted to go there, that'd be great. But I think that in some ways, I, when I think back on the feedback I heard last year from folks, if folks have some of that same feedback, there may be more ways to impact the measure under B. So, so it's just a few thoughts to keep in mind about why it may be a good way to go. And, and I personally, this is a 2040 plan. I can live with it not coming out every single year honestly you know so those the things that we're bending take a long time to show change anyway so I'm okay checking in on it every year personally but all right thanks director Stolz thank you very much so my recollection of our previous conversation was we actually had gotten a lot of agreement on both measure a and B but there was a lot of discussion left on what the target should be um, so with the way that it's written, I'm, I'm very much in favor of having both measure A and B. And if, if you read how it's written, we're just saying 50% of the people, 50% of the cost of affordable to the typical household in the region. It's, a, it's not a particularly high bar to set. Um, so I think you should look at the whole thing. Uh, I think A and B are both quite good and both attainable and things that we should do as a region. Thanks. In the queue, I have uh, Director Graves, then Director Malay. Director Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to speak in favor of option B at a minimum. Just as a reminder, uh, you know, the city of Denver now is going to surpass 700,000 people by the end of this summer. And the Hancock administration has stated very clearly in every arena that we're part of that this is one of the greatest crises uh, of this administration that we're working very hard to address. And so it, it's not possible for us to adopt either to really address these, these critical challenges. You know, in an ideal world, I'd like to see both adopted because I do think that they are nuanced and they address two different sides of the, the, the issue that we need to uh, pull together to, to address squarely. Uh, but I would be comfortable at least adopting option B. Thank you. Director Mullay. I, I am not in favor of option A at all. I, I am very concerned about us actually adopting that. Um, and uh, But I do appreciate the fact that this affordability issue is, a, in no way does that reflect my uh, opinion that this is not a crisis in the metro area and something that's very important. But my concern is more our ability to really be inf impactful in changing that, short of putting in affordable housing, which. I think is a politically charged issue and also addressing construction defects, which is not happening in the near future. So, but I do appreciate the fact that the affordability of the region is a very important thing, not only for the least among us, but I think also, as was stated by Director Kanish, for employment opportunities for people coming to the region. I think the H plus T is actually a more comprehensive way to look at the affordability of the region because there's always been a trade-off with folks who do move out to the suburbs because the housing costs are lower but then they may have a higher transportation cost. And if you're really looking at the true impact on a family and affordability, you need to see both of them. And I think to just show the housing without the transportation piece and then or show both of them, you're double counting the same value on housing. And I think they go hand in hand with each other. If it costs people a fortune to, to, to commute from an area, then they're, they're gonna be at a loss. So I um, am in favor of of B, um, and I think with A, we're missing the, the piece that we can influence uh, with transportation. So I, I, I could see moving uh, B forward. What a surprise that this was heavily conversed last time around as well. It, it, I, if I just may make a comment, I, I, did, I, I just don't think there, there was a lot of agreement on moving them both forward. I think there was a real vigorous debate and a, a huge issue with A, frankly, from my recollection. So in the queue, I have Director Jones, Director Henry, and Director Beekman. Director Jones. Well, um, I think that affordability is one of the biggest issues facing this region. It certainly is the case in Boulder County. And most all the communities in Boulder County and I think when we're looking at affordability housing is the number one cost transportation is the second cost so I do think that there's some wisdom in looking at them together I think as director Malay pointed off there's a trade-off the further you live out often the cheaper your house is but the more you spend on transportation you live in close to a transit line your house may be more expensive 
but you may be able to have a one car or no car household and reduce. So there's um, opportunities for residents um, and communities to address affordability if we include both housing and transportation. So I'd be in favor of including both A and B, but I think B at a minimum, if that's where we can reach common ground, I think um, would be the easiest way for Dr. Cog to speak on this issue. Um, I also would point out that um, doing so dovetails with a lot of the other Metro Vision goals that we have. So we get sort of a twofer in dealing with, you know, emissions, um, BMT, et cetera, when we include transportation in there as well. And from talking with our staff, I think increasingly the H plus T methodology is being embraced by communities around the country. HUD has embraced it. So I'm less concerned about um, getting data in a timely fashion going forward. I think this is the, the measure that's most likely to be used going forward. Um, so I would support at a minimum that we um, go with Measure B. Director Henry. I, I just think basically what we all need to, to think about as a region is the fact that it's costing us in our economy. Um, the P-Time Foundation and CSU did a study where it was just Adams County centric and we are losing six million dollars a year in our economy because most uh, majority of our citizens are over 50 percent house burden. So they're paying over 50 percent of their income and they would be spending that out in the economy in our stores or grocery stores or movie theaters. Um, so it has an economic cost um, to everyone in our communities. I also think that it, um, well, I, I know that it's, it's, it's definitely keeping a lot of corporations away from the Denver metro area because of the cost of our housing. They don't want to relocate into this area because housing is, is a shortage of housing and the cost of housing. So I really, I'm in support of both of them, both A and B, um, if we could uh, get both of them passed. So that's my thought. Director Beacom. I think I've. Is it working? Okay. I, I've heard a lot of very good ideas and I agree with probably the majority of them. Um, I had a slightly different concern in the beginning on this and that was were the proposed targets for 2040 based on the shortages that we have already on, on housing and everything else even remotely um, attainable. And I don't know if that impacts this or not but it um, I know in Broomfield we're having trouble getting the cost of a house down to less than three hundred thousand dollars just simply because of the cost of water, land, and sewer, etc. So that's not an affordable house, and so it's also the regional problem. And the Post recently had their article that kind of indicated that there's a thirty or forty thousand unit shortage every year in what the need is. And based on that, that's a growing figure. So I think we do have a serious regional problem in this whole area, and we do need to do something with it. My concern was not that we have to do something with it, but are we being even realistic that we can do much to do it even between 2040 and now to get these reduced? Director Beekman, if I could ask, did, so did you uh, have a, a clear choice in your mind or just kind of your I, comment? I would go with either, but I think B is the better of the two because Thank it reflects better. Um, I have uh, Director Shakti. I, well, I saw you pull the mic forward. I was assuming that meant, and then Director, and then Director Millay. I don't have much to add except sort of an agreement with what I'm hearing, which is housing is the elephant in the room in Lakewood, just like everywhere else. And um, I support both, but I'm okay with just B. Director Malay. I do have some questions about the target and I would, I would, like, I'd like to understand that a little bit better. So if, I, I wanna separate the discussion a little bit. I'm, I, I want B, but I wanna understand what the, the baseline is and what the target is associated with it. So it's just a question clarification. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not considering, I'm not saying, oh, that's our goal yet. I'm not there yet. 
Director Kanich, and then I'm going to try to see if anybody else that hasn't spoken would like to. I, um, I would suggest to this point about the targets, it might be easier for our brains to follow B if it was written as a decrease goal rather than an increase. Um, we have most of the bad, like things that are too expensive are bad. You want to decrease that. You know, we have many other goals. I was looking, we, at least three of them, decrease VMT, decrease emissions, those things. So, so if you flipped this, it would be the baseline would be 59%. And the goal would be decrease it to 50%, which is that less than, you know, we want to get below half of our region struggling with these things. And I think that to me seems like a, a, it's, it's not um, out of the question, I think, um, in terms of, you know, the kinds of investments that are possible. I mean, even market rate housing, if it's, you know, is, is, is going to help. Supply will help some of this. And so... So to me, it's like a little bitty stretch goal. It's not a like this is impossible stretch goal. But it's also one of the things, some of these measures we've had for decades, this is our first time setting it. And I think there's not a scientific way to set something the first time. We're going to kind of have to see how it moves. So to me, it seems like, you know, not impossible. But also, I don't want to just choose a goal we already know we can meet. I want to stretch a little. So. Other conversation that people that haven't had an opportunity so far? Am I Direct, to talk? You don't have to. I wasn't planning on it. People are encouraging you to. Apparently, but. I had nothing to say to anyone, but. Um, Director Pfeiffer, please go know, ahead. Well, I, I agree. I'm going to, it's just repetitive, but I agree with everyone's point. I mean, of course, I could see A and B. I'd love to see A and B both passed. Um, but there are struggles with A. Um, I mean, it, it, it's something we all want to strive for. But uh, I'm just reflecting in our community that I, I just I think A would be a very hard thing for my community to get through. And two, B is the compromise. Um, Director Graves, I agree with what he said. I think B is at least an, uh, an attempt because what we're trying to do is lower transportation costs. We can't control the market. We, we have some ideas popping up. I was just telling Director Dayak that we're talking about mini homes. And what does that mean to our community? It's a policy question um, because we're trying to get something under $100,000. And what does that mean? We don't know. But in the meantime, what's within our control, we believe, is transportation. And that's where we can address it. We're looking at trying to do some things that, like Golden did um, with the shuttle and last mile, <clears throat> try to do some stuff free for our citizens. Um, and I think that's all within our control. So I think B is where I would land, just because I know I can be an active contributor to the overall region and the goal uh, more effective than I could with just housing. So you asked for it and you got it. All right, so uh, what I have in my, I think, accurate but unofficial tally here is that basically we had one, uh, one person, one director speak against moving either one forward. We had one speak in favor of just A. We have uh, four that are strongly in support of A and B both moving forward. And we have seven who have spoken for, at a minimum, moving B, but some of those seven also were proponents of A and B. So, um, yeah, this is why we had the same interesting conversation last go around. So I, I guess what I'd like to do is uh, start with what appears to have the most support and just kind of take a sense of the room of are we comfortable as a group moving just B forward as a recommendation of the full board? No, we do not vote. I just kind of want to have a, a general idea, wink with your right eye, or... Um, uh, <laughs> direct, Director Holen. I, I'm, and this is kind of talking to Robin's issue, I'm... Um, trying to determine what the percentage measures. Are we saying in, in A that we, our goal is to keep the, the housing expenses 20% uh, of, of the total household income? Is that what the response? 
I, I can walk you through sort of the math, not really the math, but sort of what both measures are. So uh, measure A is the percentage of households in this region that are considered cost burdened, right, which means they're spending more than 30 percent of their income for either um, homeowner expenses or rental expenses. That figure right now is 35 percent. So the, the way the target is written is we would lower that to 25 percent. Uh, the next one, uh, for so that one, everybody got that one? Um, for B, um, the, the standard way of thinking of housing plus transportation costs, as Director Jones mentioned, these are oftentimes the two primary and largest pieces of a household budget. Um, and so they typically set that threshold at 45%. So 30% for housing, 15% for transportation, just to kind of um, make numbers up. Um, when, when this measure was discussed back in probably May, April or May, um, Invic des decided, let's send this down to TAC, let, let the Transportation Advisory Committee have a conversation about it. And so when it came back, it came back in this format, which is we know as a region, based on this data, where the places are that you, um, that a median person can actually afford to live based on that 45% threshold. And we would just simply count the number of households that are within those areas. So as of right now, if you drew a map in the, of the region and identify those places which are affordable under this index, 41 percent um, of the households in the region live in those places and so the target would be to increase that to that half the region lives in places um, that would be considered affordable under the index so you have two ways of moving that right you put more households in those places or you create more of those places hopefully that helped and didn't confuse matters thank you in the queue i have uh, director teal then director jones and director dyack well, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to suggest that if we don't feel like we have a good consensus here, perhaps we do just advance these two questions to the board without a recommendation from the work session and, uh, and actually don't have this detailed conversation here, but have it at the board, have it in, uh, in the public forum that the board allows. I'll just point out that um, part of the reason we changed the format of this from MVIC group to a work session was that everybody on the board is invited to be here and participate um, and if they choose not to be but the the hope was that we don't have the same conversation here and then again at the board level um, and I'm, I, I don't think that uh, moving it forward without recommendation and having the full conversation at the board is necessarily a bad idea. I just wanted to remind this body why this, why the format was changed. Director Teal. And, and Mr. Chairman, that's, that's kind of why I tried to choose my words carefully <laughs> under the idea that, you know, perhaps this is, a, I, I think this has been a great conversation. Um, it has certainly uh, been enlightening for me. However, because of our format change and because of uh, um, our interpretation of the uh, public meeting laws and how that impacts what this used to be, uh, again, perhaps, perhaps we shouldn't try to make that decision here. Perhaps we should just move along and uh, move it to the board and then have that full decision, excuse me, that full conversation that we can legally come to a decision. Thank you, Director Teal. Director Jones. Thank you. Um, so I'm uh, going to suggest an alternative to that. Um, since I don't want, this is a good conversation and we may have some of it again at the full board level. But um, I felt like we were headed towards some potential common ground. And if I could indulge the chair to allow us to be a little more demonstrative in a non-binding, non-voting straw poll fashion by raising our hands if we would be willing to move Measure B forward, um, that might get, get us some clarity on whether or not we do indeed have that common ground that I think exists. I think that's a good idea. I will entertain it, but since Director Dyack has not had an opportunity to speak, I'm going to defer if, he, if you would like to make a statement. I'll be quick. Um, so I, I, out of the two, I believe my town um, would, would look at B as being more favorable or more relevant to, to Parker. Um, I also think from a um, clarity standpoint, the, the share of the region's population, um, I understand what you said, Brad, but may, it's an indirect uh, target or, or measure. So maybe just 
defining within there or in the notes that it is 45 percent because I'm looking at that and I'm thinking that 50 percent or 41 percent is the H plus T. So just a format. And Director Brockett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just to, wanted to throw my voice in amongst those who are interested in both A and B but would be willing to go forward with just B as the recommendation of the board and just highlight just briefly the synergies that Director Jones pointed out with um, housing and transportation combined with some of our other measures like uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled. Um, so anyway, and then I do support uh, Director Jones's idea of the straw poll for moving recommendation forward. And again, keeping with the people that haven't had an opportunity, I'll go to Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a point of clarity, let's say one a or B is favored. Will both A and B be brought forward to the whole board? My, my point sense. is, and maybe not to answer the question, but my point is this is the work session, it's not mandatory. So anything brought here should be brought to the full board. I'm thinking. I, I guess my, my thought on that, Director Partridge, would be that, again, the full board is invited to participate in this work session. I, I would defer to staff, but my thought would be that both of them would move forward with the recommendation from both staff and the work session or whatever that is. Does that make sense? Executive Director Shuffle. I don't think that we would move them both forward unless it was clear that that was what the majority of this group thought we needed to do. Um, if, if you were to say A and B was what you wanted, that's what we would do. If you said B or none, I mean, I, it is not our intent to take everything. It is our intent to take to the board what decisions, not even decisions, because you don't vote. Um, it would be our intent to take to the board what uh, the collective seems to think that the board needs to take. So if it's just B, it would be just B. We would not be taking uh, A, to Dir give an example at least. Director Kanich. Thanks. I think this is a really helpful conversation because it's kind of our first kind of contentious issue since the, um, uh, since the governance changes. But just to refresh folks, one of the goals of the governance changes was to use this convers the conversation and studies group to narrow the field, right? So, but there is always a democratic process at the board, which is so, for example, if we narrow the field to B, then anyone could make a motion to do, you know, to, to reject B, to, to bring back A from earlier. So, all of that democratic potential still exists. And so, every individual member has that ability to raise those kinds of motions. But this allows us to kind of move the ball forward and help the staff narrow. And I, I think it's almost a misnomer to make the distinction between the study session and the board because in a lot of ways, every single board vote we're taking on this document is also a straw vote because in the end, there's only one vote that really matters and that's the vote to adopt or not adopt. So in truth, I think it's kind of a false distinction because when we take these votes at the board on each section, you still then at the end have to adopt the entire document. That's the, I mean, in some ways, it's, we break it up because it's more efficient that way but in the end of the day, just because you've adopted each section along the way, it does not bind any member to vote for the ultimate document. So just remember that even the board votes in some ways are straw votes until the entire document's done. And then you'll have a decision to make about the whole. So, so I actually don't think there's a big distinction between voting here and voting there, at least on this kind of a document. We're just editing is what we're doing. So. so we have several people who have their hands up again, and I'm more than happy to continue the conversation. Um, just wanted to remind everybody that, you know, there is a there is kind of an opportunity for us to take a straw vote, and I'll go around with the people that have had their hand up, and that is Stolzman, Teal, Malay, and Partridge. Director Stolzman. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. I, I just I do value the work session so that we can flesh out some of these issues and understand things in more detail and ask staff, you know, more in depth questions and then that information can help form what's a more final draft 
for the board to consider and then we can do any final editing at the board I, so I do think that this is a valuable process but I, I agree with whoever said you know that if something gets moved to the board and someone wasn't at the work session they can bring up something that wasn't considered and change it at the board so I, I really don't consider this voting and I don't think it's appropriate to call it voting because it is a work session but I, I value this process so that we can get a more final draft to consider when we go to the board meeting director Teal thank you mr. chairman uh, just a brief question for the executive director if uh, let us say we have our straw poll here and B is uh, and we do vote excuse me, straw poll to advance B to the board with the recommendation of the study session, will it also be noted that it B is being sent to the board without the recommendation of staff? No, I think that Brad said in, in his opening remarks that staff we laid out in here that we didn't think that this was the best measure because it's not something that we can do annually. It's uh, the methodology is different, has been different when they've done this before. There are, um, um, uh, it's not, it's a lag measure for sure. The data that, the most recent data we have is 2013. But what we heard from members up to this point was that's okay. This is a measure I prefer as the board. So this is what we want. So it's your opinion that matters most we gave you our recommendation based on how the data is collected and, and and analyzed but if this is the measure you want to use then then that's what we would do because as the chair has pointed out this this is supposed to be a work session of the full board that not everyone is here is is unfortunate but everyone is invited to participate here so this group is real I mean you are the board so we would be forwarding whatever you have given us to the full board to consider. I mean, if there, I, in this particular instance, I told you what staff would do. I, I guess if there was something that you know staff was just really opposed to, um, uh, and I can't imagine what that would be, but I, I guess if there was something like that, we might say, you know, staff continues to oppose this for these reasons, but um, not on this particular issue. So uh, as a board member, may I please ask the executive director to uh, ensure that, um, uh, you know, Brad's caveats uh, that he did introduce in terms of his concerns about being able to uh, measure the H&T every year, could I please ask that that be included in the board presentation uh, later this month? Sure, we're happy to do that. Um, we, we would say exactly what Brad has, has already said. Outstanding, thank you. So in the queue I have uh, Director Malay Partridge and Shakti, and then I'm going to take a pause. Director Malay. I, I guess I'm going to speak to the fact that to me this is very comparable to the study sessions that I have in my council and that where we provide direction to staff about what we want to happen and the information we want to see before we make a final vote. And if the direction to the staff is, is a ch departure <laughs> from what was originally presented by staff, it's the weight of the body, the study session meeting that then says before it goes to the full board, this is the, you know, we heard your input and that is what we said we wanted from this. We, this was our opportunity to direct staff before it comes to the full board. So I, I would expect um, that, and I completely agree with the process, that does not preclude uh, one of my council members or one of these board directors from bringing something up they want to change. But this is, you know, when I have not been able to attend a study session, I've read the notes and the minutes, so I understand the discussion that happened. And that's the incumbent on every board director before the meeting. So um, it, it's our responsibility to catch up on what we missed. It's not the board's responsibility to re-educate someone at the full board meeting when they, for one reason or another, have not been able to participate at the work session. That doesn't mean they can't express their viewpoint, though. That's how I see this. Director Partridge. Question regarding N and B when we talk about H and T. Is the H and B the exact same as it is in A? I'll turn to Andy near the answer to that. So he's, 
when they when they form when they when uh, CNT uh, uses HUD data or census data to calculate housing costs, would the cost burden piece be the same in both, or is they using the same root data source? They're using the same root data yes. source through the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau. Okay, great, thank you. And somewhat I agree. It's same thing. Working through working through a work session, but I also believe we go through a full public process. No doubt, public has that same position as any director, but I still argue that we are missing bringing this to the full board. That is, you know, that's just my feeling. I think when we've had so much conversation to this, I think because there's so much information that goes in, I think it's, it somewhat is the impression that this work session still supersedes the full board action. I just wanted to uh, point out, though, that this body has made other recommendations to the board where a uh, consensus was given of a comfort level of something moving forward, and we didn't move forward all four choices. We moved forward the one recommended choice. So that has been kind of the... <coughs> the uh, measure by what what we've done other things and and part of the reason I'll point out again and I don't mean to be redundant but part of the reason that this structure was changed was because the MVIC committee for those who weren't involved at the time the MVIC committee was a specific select group of people based on uh, communities community size and various things so it was seen as kind of an exclusive group, but what that, what that did was the MVIC committee would have a broad discussion on an issue and make a recommendation to move it forward to the board, and the full board, especially those who were not involved in the MVIC committee, would have that same conversation all over again. So we were trying to avoid the Groundhog Day of having the same conversation at two different meetings that half the people were at, but the other half weren't. So that was, that was why this was formed in the way it was, and as uh, Director Schaffel mentioned, uh, was open to the entire body of the board, and um, as Director Malay mentioned, if they cannot be here for one reason or another, um, you know, we understand that, but you know, it, it's incumbent on them to then help educate themselves. Now I will say again, that doesn't mean they can't come to the to the full board and still make suggested changes or recommendations, but the whole goal was to try to figure out a way to avoid that Groundhog Day scenario that we were stuck in for a year. So uh, I'm going to go to Director Shakti, and then I'd like to take Director Shakti's it's passing. Been said. What I wanted to say has been said. Okay. And there is one other person who has not spoken that had their hand up, uh, Director uh, Sheriff Graves. Can you get a mic, please? Um, so I do want to be clear that, or I want to just say into the, into the conversation that in Golden, we definitely look at, or we're currently looking at, um, the share of the reg our region's households that are housing cost burden as kind of our, our primary um, way of looking at it. We've also, I don't know, maybe you've heard, but we took the measure of hiring. We're small, but we took the measure of hiring for a two-year period, a person to dive into this issue for us and look at different alternatives. So what I'm going to go back is I'm going to do is, is talk about B with our expert. Now, I have a question, though, and that has to do with data collection, because that appeared to be the basis for staff's um, recommending A over B. Uh, if we move B forward, somewhat to uh, Director Teal's comment, what I would be interested in, and maybe you have it now or maybe you would have it then for the, for the, um, the board meeting, is kind of a forecast because this is such an important issue for so many communities, not just Colorado, but certainly across Colorado, a forecast in terms of what can, what can we look to in the future in terms of data collection. 
and how is that going to change in the near future? And how does that impact, I mean, you made your recommendation based on what you know at this time, but my guess is that our ability to, to track this data is going to change because we're going to need to change it. It's going to be demanded that we change it. So um, that's what I wanted to um, bring up. Thank you. Okay, as promised, we're going to have a pause now. And the pause is to have an unofficial straw poll uh, because of the nature of, and, and right now it is um, very much favoring uh, B as the one that is going to be recommended to move forward. So that's what I'm going to start with. I am going to ask for a show of hands. And again, this is an unofficial straw poll, but I'd like to see a show of hands of those in favor of moving B forward, please. And that is more than enough, not quite unanimous, but it is more than enough. So we'll move B forward with the recommendation of this body and with, um, as a couple of people mentioned, the uh, conversation that um, it'll be prepped or, ca or caveated the way that Brad did on this moving forward to the board. All right. So let's move on to C, and I will point out just a quick time check. We're at 521, and we complete at 6 o'clock. So um, we're moving on to C. Uh, Director Holen. I would just like to, to go back and see if we can have a straw poll on those favoring A. I'm not sure that there's a need to do that because we had an overwhelming majority that favored B. So I, I don't know that, I, and we, we can, I guess. This is, this is both. I mean, if A passes, then it would be A and B. Is there, let's, let's do the straw poll once again then and see how many are in favor of recommending both to move forward. That is, that is not a majority. So we will be, uh, thank you for that, Director Holland, we will be moving B forward. So moving on to C, any specific conversation yeah, on this? I'm happy or? to do a recap if it's necessary. Um, just, just let me know if that's what I should do for, for each or all, the, all of them together again. I, uh, I think what I'd like to do is take them one at a time and um, see if there's a uh, consensus to, to move them forward without a staff presentation or if we want to hear more detail. So let's start with C. I'll open the floor for discussion. Director Christman. I've been saving up my words. <laughs> um, first of all, I think um, it's important as it was in B to reference transportation. I am assuming you mean investments in transportation infrastructure. Director Christman, could I ask you to move your mic a little closer, oh, please? okay. Thank you. Transportation. Uh, secondly, I think um, the thrive, we say people and businesses to thrive and prosper. Um, isn't may you live long and prosper from um, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure? <laughs> Star, Trek. Star Trek, okay. Um, it's, it's a little too wish, but really my point is, um, measuring employment against investment to see if people generally are thriving and are non sequiturs. Uh, we have uh, large numbers of people who um, will be retiring in this community. Yep. Uh, the fact that employment increased doesn't tell us uh, that people are thriving or prospering or that our investments in infrastructure had any impact on that. Um, I just, I think it's a total, it's a non sequitur and it's not a valid measure. If our goal is to find out if people are thriving and prospering, just the fact that we, and businesses, that we have more uh, employment doesn't tell you that, particularly since we're going to have a large segment of our population that will be retired. That's my comments. Thank you. So I wanted to just mention for clarity that um, although a director can certainly recommend changes, this is something that has already been board approved. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Director Teal. Just a 
plan outcome. Just, just yeah. the, the, the yes, the outcome. Excuse me. Thank you. Yes, Director Teal. I think it's great. It's uh, very much uh, in line with our role as a metropolitan planning organization. Very much in line with our regional tr with the um, responsibilities we have as the regional planning um, organization. Um, I think the targets are just fine. I think uh, where staff drew those, um, uh, I, I'm not. I don't need to go down the rabbit hole with those ones. Uh, so I would like to very much speak in favor of C and moving it forward to the full board. Other comments? Director Malay. I, I have to agree with Mayor Christman in the sense that, yeah, I think increase in employment is great, but it, it what kind of jobs are we talking about? Are we talking about quality jobs that allow people to afford to live here and, and function and, and uh, pay the ridiculous rents and pay for transportation? So I don't have a problem measuring it, but I don't really think it's a very telling measure. I really don't. It, Other comments? Just a general uh, feel of whether or not we are comfortable moving this forward to the full board. Is C ready to go to the full board? I'm not seeing anybody stomping their feet or slapping their hand on the table, so I'm going to say it is. Moving on to D. <laughs> Director Christman. Okay. Um. A, I'm not sure what protected open space means, uh, but, um, and if that just means a golf course that no one can get on unless they um, are a member, I'm not sure that means protected open space. But um, once again, a just straight square miles, I don't know that that's really a good measure. It has nothing to do with the number of people, whether they have, um, if you have a pocket park in Denver surrounded by apartments, that has a great deal of value to the people who live nearby. If you add 15 miles of open space 40 miles away, even though that would be better for our measurement, I don't think it's really better for the community. So I, I just I don't like the me measurement. Uh, how we're measuring it. In the queue, I have Director Teal, then Director Jones. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to echo some of the concerns uh, brought up by Director Christman. And uh, at the very least, it's a violation of the common sense laws of supply and demand. We just got done talking for the vast majority of our time about protecting you know, um, affordable housing. And how are we going to plan for it? How are we going to write it into the strategic plan? And the importance it has for us. And we invested a lot of time in it. And here we are kind of making a common sense violation of supply and demand by saying, and oh, by the way, let's protect and let's limit that basic element of housing, namely the land that housing will be built upon. So I, too, echo the concerns mentioned by Director Christman and would ask that we not move this one forward. Director Jones. So I just want to remind folks that the plan outcome has already been approved by the board. Protecting open space has been a part of our Metro vision from the very beginning. We aren't, well, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to badmouth New Jersey, but one of the, the, the yeah, so I won't compare us to anybody. We, uh, our region is unique and special for many reasons, but one of the biggest region, reasons is our incredible uh, natural heritage and our landscapes, the scenery, the outdoor recreation, the wildlife, um, all of that adds up to a high quality of life for our residents and incredibly important economic value. So that's kind of, you know, when you think of Colorado, when you think of the metro area, that's one of the first things you think about. So protected open space, I assume, is defined in Boulder County, we have a pretty clear idea what protected open space means. It means it can't be developed or degraded. I'm okay with the metric of measuring square miles because uh, open space has a lot of very important purposes, and it varies. It could be a pocket park that is a playground for young children in, in an urban setting. It could be a, an elk migration corridor up in the foothills. It's a very different um, value but equally important. 
Um, they're different sizes, locations, um, but they all add up to an important value for our region. Um, so I, I think I'm fine with the shorthand. It is a little bit confusing how we've changed the measurement of open space, so we can't really look at the trend because we're now including federal land, but I think that once you know that, I think that this is a fine measurement. So I'll ask staff, is, uh, Brad, is the uh, open space, is that something that's clearly defined elsewhere in the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, we, we, each year one of the things that we do is we do a series of um, a data request for all your jurisdictions as well as stakeholders to make sure that we have um, uh, data that we ultimately compile up to the regional level and so we in that process define what we think of as an open space um, categorization and that really that 1,841 square miles comes from that open space inventory. And so specifically to Director Christman's concern um, and I'm, I'm sure that's not that was an isolated example there might have been others that you could have thought of as well, but that would, I assume, not include a private golf course. She pointed to one of the hard, the hard, the two hardest ones in my history of doing this work are golf courses and cemeteries. How do you, how do you, how do you think of those? Cemeteries are often, I mean, cemetery, sort of the modern parks movement started as cemeteries, but how do you classify them? So we do go through that process. Um, the other thing that we also struggle with sometimes is, is HOA um, lands, which aren't necessarily publicly accessible as well. So we, we, we try to think about sort of the public access piece and thinking about what we report out. Okay. Uh, next, I had Director Holan and then Director Brockett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Arapahoe County has one of the most v vigorous uh, open space programs, uh, and we distribute millions of dollars a year to our municipalities to to uh, help them with their open space programs. Um, I, I agree to some degree with with uh, direct with uh, uh, with. Uh, uh, Mayor Christian on, on her on her concern and I, and I think there is a, also a lack in the analysis of uh, defining the quality is a, you know is a is an open field uh, as valuable as as say a an athletic field um, or a, a bike trail or a bike track um, so there's really a lack of quantitative uh, measurement here and I, I don't have an answer for you to how to determine that. Um, uh, square miles may be one element of it, but um, uh, how do you quantify the importance and priority of an open space area? Uh, an open space area in a, in a, in a, in a, in a low income area has, has, has a lot of value um, because it, it, it provides access, whereas um, Going up to a to a uh, uh, a nature park up in um, in eastern Arapahoe County, uh, where there's not a lot of access, doesn't have the the quantitative level of involvement and in service to those to those uh, to the, to those populations who can't access it. So, okay, I have Director Brockett, then Director Kanich. Director Brockett. Uh, well, I would like to speak in, in favor of the measure and just I, I would say that you know, the protected open space of one kind or another I think is central to our identity as a region. Um, it's certainly true of Boulder and Boulder County, but I think of Denver Metro as a whole, you know, without our mountain backdrop, uh, you know, what are we? So I, I think it's it's really important to, to, to most of the residents of our region. And I just wanted to note that the, um, the target is really quite modest. It's a 14% increase over 25 years so it's well under um, a one percent uh, growth rate whereas the uh, the employment target for example is a uh, 44 percent increase over 25 years so it's really it's not about removing all of our potential housing stock it's about making modest increases in an area I think that's very important yeah, I have director Kanich and then director Shakti director Kanich thanks an overall comment that may be helpful for future uh, ones that we're going to discuss as well. I feel like we maybe skipped a piece of the intro that we had the last time we did this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but these foundational measures are the only ones we set targets for, and in that sense, they're the grossest, the, by gross, not disgusting, but like broadest, right? Um, because you want to be able to capture something at a very high level. And then we have these other things called secondary measures, which can get at nuance. So for example, we might have, and I don't know, a secondary measure that's basically trail mileage, 
right, or things like that. So, so um, I, I don't know if that'd be helpful for folks just to review that because I think that some of the nuance that folks want to get at, we can get at in those secondary <coughs> measures. We don't set targets for each of those. We try to keep it, you know, but we can track it. So over time, we can look at the trail mileage and we can see if it's going up. We can see if it's going down. And um, we can see all of that on each of those more nuanced levels, how much open space, for example, is accessible to low-income communities. Like, I care a lot about that. And so, but in some ways, these, um, uh, Director Christman, I think you're, you're very um, astute at picking up at how gross the, the, both the prior one and this one are. And I think that in some ways that is intentional. Um, but I'll just look to the staff to kind of correct me if I'm wrong on that. But sure. The word that came, came into my mind was coarse. Uh, okay, rather there than you go. But they're, they're, they're the sort of, the, to your point, sort of the largest, most expansive way to view this, right? Because I, I agree, you know, we, we've thought about these other measures, and one of them, ha other things that we've talked about have been overall regional trail coverage. We have thought about sort of the access piece, maybe even by sort of income or some other some other way of thinking about it. So. So to, uh, to the director's point, I mean, this is the dozen or so high-level headline um, type of things, but we will continuously um, measure other things that you have suggested are important um, to you uh, throughout the process to sort of monitor how, how we're doing in, in, in terms of being um, true to what the, what the vision that's laid out in MetroVision. Director Shakti. I just wanted to respond to Director Teal's comment about the correlation between land and housing. And I, I do think that um, that's a logical statement. I also think that um, there are ways to build so that we get more housing and we have more open space. And that is the kind of community that I think the people in this region want. So that's why it makes sense to be having these conversations. Director Beacom. Um, my question is, is that when we get to the 2,100 square miles of protected open space, that's roughly 40% of uh, the region. And I'm unclear exactly what's in protected open space because I kind of look at things as open space, which is protected, open lands, which may or may not be protected, and then even uh, the areas around the... Um, parkways and stuff where the uh, highways are, where you've got this land, it's open, but it's not protected open space. It's not going to develop except for more lanes. So it's, I guess what I'm asking for is a little more clarity of how much open land or open area is there that isn't actually protected open space. Mr. Calvert. Andy, do you, do you want to take a shot at just sort of defining kind of how our protected open space layer defines open space? Sure. Our uh, GIS team does, puts a lot of work into um, trying to get everyone's different inventories into some sort of standard categories. It does include things like agricultural easements, which are provided to us by a lot of the locals. Uh, it, so uh, it does include um, a lot of different kinds of golf courses, HOAs. Um, we did filter out some of the, the properties related to schools because some people do include those in those inventories, but it's not consistent community to community. So it does include a very broad range uh, in that inventory, um, and, and we're somewhat limited in the ways uh, we, we can uh, drill down, but we do have some ways we can drill down and, and, and how much uh, is remaining um, to be developed. Director Beekman. The I'm, I'm unclear from your answer. Is all that you just said open space, protected open space, when you drill down, or is something? Yes, that everything we included in that number, everything that I just described, is included in that protected open space uh, so, number. So the golf courses are protected open space. Would it not be maybe more clear to call it open land, protected open land, rather than open space? Because I think open space has a very clear definition in most people's minds. That's land set aside for us to have for future enjoyment, not use, but enjoyment. Okay. So I think that we may want to think about the measure being redefined a little bit from being open space to maybe open land. And I, I almost, I'll, I'm going to say something, Andy, and you just tell me if I'm wrong or not. Uh, the way that I think of our protected open space layer, it, it is 
more, it is more accurate to call it open space than it is to call it open land. Um, we do not have things in our open space inventory that are 160 acre uh, track that has never been developed but is likely to be developed in the future, right? We have things that people have said operate as open space, however open space is defined at the local level, right? Some folks count um, lands within their within HOAs and send them to us. Other jurisdictions don't count that in their open space inventory. So in many ways, we defer to a locally defined set of how local member governments define open space, and we do our best to aggregate that up uh, to a regional level. So, so if, if Broomfield includes uh, properties owned and managed by HOAs in, their, in uh, your open space inventory and you send, send that to us, we count it. If you didn't, then we wouldn't. Does that make sense? And, and so it is, very, it is not about, it is lands that are protected as open space based on how it's defined at the local level. And I, and I think that this is a um, conversation we're going to have a couple of months from now is about the UGA, UGB. And one of the things that has been explained to me by staff here is that they are not in the business of being a manager of that. They're in the business of being an accounting firm. So that's kind of how I view this same, as same well. thing so we 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 defer to sort of the local way that i mean i think director jones talked about how boulder county thinks of open space we defer to how boulder county thinks of open space and just do our best when we're comparing how boulder county thinks of it and how broomfield thinks of it to make sure when we're, when we're represented at the regional level we're being fair to both ways that it's classified director partridge thank you mr chair uh, brad maybe we i missed it maybe you're going to repeat it but can you how did you come up with going from 1841 to 2100? Uh, I think someone referred to the 40% number. That's kind of what we, we wanted to show some amount of growth. Um, it's actually less than the previous. You, there is some reference to this um, in some of the background material. We had previous plans that called for about an increase of 310 some odd square miles of really locally uh, managed parks and open space and we, we shrunk that a little bit so it's in many ways it's less ambitious of a target than we've had um, in the past largely because we were including federal lands that could potentially get disposed of and 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 the number could go the other direction um, as well so. director Fernanic, is that your music So what I mean, it's not necessarily a scientific analytical model nope. that you it's, use, it's, and that's my, that's my concern, because I'm going to just I tell you, uh, this is about 30% the size of Douglas County to give you an idea. So that, that's certainly concerning, and I would say it certainly be concerning for any municipality to consider annexation. That's a, that's a large amount of land that we're, we're talking about. And when you look at it, just first to be concerned, we have agricultural property that is now open space that is not being used agriculturally. So and we do want to support agriculture and move it forward. But here on the other hand, we're actually diminishing the ability for agriculture to go forward. So I think it's just all a concern for us that I think we really need a little bit more analytical, scientific, tested method say how do you come up going 1841 2100 it's just a it's not scientific in my mind I think we need that and I think to um, I'm sure that everybody saw this but on the backup that's behind here in 2013 the number was 1826 square miles 2014 1841 and the dr. cog region as a whole is 5288 so but I understand your concern Director Partridge. Other comments? I am not feeling any clear direction on this particular issue. Is there anybody who has not had an opportunity to speak that would like to? Director Stoltzman. I think it's an important measure to have uh, the measurement of open space. I, I, I'm fine with more discussion on what the precise number needs to be for the target. I can understand why there would be a desire for that. But, for example, agricultural use of protected open space is appropriate, at least in Boulder County. I don't know what other counties and jurisdictions do. I, I actually think in some areas people count their streetscape area in their open space inventory. Um, so I, I think it is a good thing that you're deferring to the local area and how they define it and how they assess the needs, the open space needs of their area and then roll it up for the region. But I think this is a very important measure. 
Director Pfeiffer. Well, we're going to put 60 acres into that very soon, so we can go with a higher number. <laughs> <laughs> Director Malay. I, I guess I look at this. Lone Tree had 3,500 acres of, of land that was undeveloped um, when I came on council or shortly before I got on council. And, and a third of that was put into open space. And really, it was a decision in a partnership with the developer and the city to do that. And I see that as the model moving forward. I think Shakti made a very good point that most people are choosing to live in Colorado or choosing to live here because of the access to get out to the open space. So I, I see this as a very achievable target. I think it's, it's the, and I, a target that the market is basically demanding. So I, I'm, I'm, I am comfortable with it, and, and I would expect a lot of these targets to be massaged over the next um, 40 years as we, um, <laughs> as we continue in this process. So, um, and I, I do think it's, a, it, and I appreciate the comment that this is a course measurement similar to the employment, because in and of alone, it really doesn't mean anything. But if you look at it in the context of individual communities, it does. Director Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was trying to uh, abstain from commenting further, but I will say that I support this measure. Denver is now, now looking again at its, its planning process, its sort of master planning process. We recently had a, a kickoff where we brought in urban planners from across the country and folks focused on park space from New York City, from North Carolina, from other places. And one of the trends that's happening across the country is increasingly people have to look at abandoned railroad lines and other things within the urban core because they're running out of places for open space. And so I think it's critically important that we have a measure like this there, right, to again set the bar for preserving those critical assets in our collective community. Thank you. Director Beacom. I, I just wanted to be very clear. I agree with the outcome of this plan. My question was only on definitions of what we're calling open space and how to make that clear so that we can actually tell all of our members how we're kind of doing it so they maybe can report it better to us. Broomfield is trying to have 40% of Broomfield be open space, not open lands, open space. Um, so it's not that I have any problem with this. I'd just like to know what we're calling what. Well, and I think the key here is that Dr. Cog is not dictating to local municipalities what that definition is. Local municipalities are telling Dr. Cog, this is what we consider it to be. Is, is that correct? Uh, and, and in some ways, maybe it's slightly reversed. You tell us what you th what you, how you define open space, and we'll figure out a way to fit it within a regional construct. Right? I mean, if someone brought up that some people use um, right-of-way associated with roads that they know is never going to be developed that are that are kept there for scenic reasons. If someone counts that and they send it to us, we, we tend to keep it. Um, we have a few things. Schools are sometimes a little bit difficult for us. We have a few things that we, we take a closer look at, but in general we defer to how local space, lo local open space is defined. Director Beacom. Um, I don't disagree with that. I just would yep. like to have a kind of a what it is we're calling this, and to me, protected open space is undefined for us to be able to get a feel for what we're actually calling it. You working with the data all the time have a good feel for yeah, that. We're, we're happy when this, if, if this ends up going forward, we'll make sure that there's some, something close to a definition that people get a sense of what this includes. Or maybe a list of the items that are yep, included. Yep, not a problem. That's all I'm asking yep. for. Thank you. So since I made the comment that it didn't appear to have clear direction, uh, the four people that have expressed their opinion are in favor of moving this forward. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of head sh shaking up and down, so we are going to move D forward. Uh, a quick time check. We have 11 minutes. And um, can we get through E? Let's open the, open the floor for discussion on item E. Director Teal. Really, question for Brad. Uh, the baseline on this one, uh, the 29.7, is that actually a measured amount throughout the region of uh, housing near a high frequency transit? Yes. And, I, and, and the other thing is to keep in mind that this, these are, this is a 2014 figure. So we had, speaking of massaging, we have, 
there's often times sort of these lags with the data. So we use, because we had 2014 on housing, we actually use 2014 for transit service as well. So for instance, this does not include the A-line because when we actually did the count of the housing, the, the transit wasn't there. So that's something we will just sort of constantly have to wrestle with to make sure we're lining up um, those two things. So yes, as of 2014, with the transit service that was available then, approximately 30% of households lived within these sort of high access transit areas. Thank you, Brad. Director Malay. So I'm just trying to understand how this and, and one work together, the share of the housing and urban centers. So does that mean that, so there's 10% of housing within urban centers, right? So that would be part, and I'm assuming that all the urban centers have access to high frequency transit. Is that a fair statement or nope. no, it is nope. not? And, and, we're, and okay. the other way too, not all places that have high capacity transit have been or, or designated as urban, urban centers. centers. Yep. Okay. It, we have something like 35 stations, if you add fast tracks, all fast tracks that don't currently have an urban center designated. Okay, all right, thank you, that, that's helpful. Director Jones. I was just going to point out that this seems like a pretty attainable goal if none of the RTD lines that are opening up this year, and there are five, are included in this. We should knock that out of the park. And I'll just make a personal comment. I still don't understand, although there's nobody here from RTD, I don't think, why the Aurora line was not called the A line. Director Pfeiffer. Our transit to the airport was called the A-Line, and she had to relinquish it, Shelly Cook's organization, just to be clear. So we were a little upset that the A-Line was stolen from us. <laughs> Arvada stole it and gave it to you guys. is before Aurora in the alphabet, so. We can, we can jump into F if we can move E forward. Are we good with E? We're moving E forward, jumping on to F. Open the floor for discussion. Director Malay. This, this is one where I share some of the concerns with the percentage. So if we just have more housing, if we just add housing, our percentage is going to go down. This one, shouldn't this be the number of acres that we're measuring, that of houses and businesses that are in hazard areas? Because shouldn't we want to reduce the number of acres, <laughs> not the percentage? Because if you just add a whole bunch of housing, our percentage that's in risk areas is going to go down. Only if you add those housing in places that aren't high risk areas. Well, okay, come on. Of course it's going to be going into the areas that aren't high risk. I mean, we're, we're, uh, communities are talking about doing that anyway. I don't know. To me, that, this is silly. <laughs> I have Director Teal and then Director Jones. Yeah, I, actually, I'd like to uh, echo the comments made by the mayor. I mean, I think... Uh, it, it, we have means of measuring, and we have multiple sources of measuring these high-risk areas, from our floodplain uh, surveys to um, understanding our wildlands and our, our natural forests and how they are interfacing with our own communities. So from that perspective, I like it. I like it a lot coming from a community that was uh, literally devastated in 1965 by a, a regional flood. Um, I do like it, but I, I like what Jackie had to say in terms of converting it from a percentage to trying to actually define and then measure the acreage. I think that would be um, far more effective uh, in terms of handling this one. Okay, I have Director Jones and then Director Shakti and then Director Pfeiffer. Well, I think it depends on how, you know, what high risk area you're dealing with. I, I think this is an important one coming from a county that both has significant floodplain and floodway issues and the wildland urban interface, which means we have huge wildfire risk. And I think this is telling us, hey, try to put houses and businesses in places where they're not going to get washed away or burnt down so that we don't put human life at risk and we don't um, continue to hemorrhage dollars during disasters. So your point is well taken. If we put our houses elsewhere, we can win on this percentage, which I think is generally, I think it's with like the urban centers and the frequency, we want to direct growth away from risky areas. And this is what this is getting at. So um, 
I, I actually think it's, it's a, appropriate as we struggle with how to be more resilient, you know, as we deal with natural hazards, which we anticipate are going to increase, to, again, we're, we're trying to guide in new investment to non-risky areas. So I, I'm actually comfortable with this goal. Then leave it. In, in, in the, in I don't have any in my community. It's not going to affect me anyway. I just think, to me, it isn't. It isn't a great measurement, but the if, queue, if the people affected love it, I withdraw my comment. <laughs> in the queue is Director Shakti, Pfeiffer, Norquist, Partridge. Director Shakti. I um, agree with the concern, although I'm not sure acreage makes sense. And I wonder if we have the number of houses and employers or jobs. I don't know how the data looks, if there's some way to... Well, you could all just tell me. Can we do that instead? <laughs> so is there, I guess there's a question for staff. Is there some reason to have it that way instead of just say, putting the number? No, I mean, I mean it, really this, we put it as a share, right? So the, the idea is that as this region grows, less and less of our development is, is occurring um, in these places, right? So that's really kind of why we use the share versus just the, the household versus um, the jobs. So, as to, to the point, I mean, clearly the number, we, we have to get to the numbers to give you the share. So doing numbers is not a problem. Director Pfeiffer. I just need point of clarification on the human created hazards. I think of the brownfield development at Arsarco. I mean, how does that play into that? I mean, we try to uh, right our wrongs with some of that, and do we want to? Well, yeah. I mean, Adams County is, is they're gone. Um, <laughs> I just hope they would speak to that. Um, are we, by any means, are we uh, discouraging brownfield cleanups with this? Just a question. I don't know. It's opposite? Well, it says share the region's employment high risk area, and we want to reduce the number of household employment, which would mean, and well, but our circle was not really, I don't know if they truly removed all the ways. Yeah, I capped it. But did, okay, I'm just asking the question. I just, I've, <laughs> we've been debating the question. I'm asking the question because I just want to not discourage brownfield cleanup. I think that's an important thing. And, and I want to make sure that this does not have some adverse effect to that. I hear Director Kanish and Director Jones saying it. Does anyone else think it or staff? I was just going to say, let's direct that to Mr. Calvert. So th this comes back to the conversation that came up earlier. This, as, as the measure that's in front of you, is really more on the natural side of things. It's, it's about floodplain and, um, and wildfire areas. But the expectation is that we would continuously figure out other ways to tie measures back to these outcomes, right? So we could, this is the coarsest version. We could potentially come back to you um, at some point in time with a measure that's really related, related more to brownfield and, and man-made hazards, but as presented, it really is that coarsest, grossest way of thinking about hazards which are, which are natural in nature. Or natural, so what's the ha human created hazards then? Oh. What well, was the, the chemical dump that the EPA did down in Durango. Okay. So, so we have two minutes and I have two people in the queue. Director Norquist. I think my uh, my question was just answered. I was I was wondering what the human created ones were. Director Partridge. Looking at the background information we have, it's gets somewhat confusing because I I, I agree, uh, Director Malay, that this percent can be thrown off because you just create a density in non-threatening areas. You reach that, and that's not really not our goal. The goal is really to decrease it in those threatened areas. So I'm wondering if staff can't work on this because when you look at housing, we pretty well have an idea of a uh, number of uh, people per house or per housing unit. Contrast that with when we look at jobs, you talk about 44,700 jobs and 3,200 establishments. Uh, unless we have an a typical establishment, a, a typical size of employees in an establishment, it's kind of interesting. So I'm wondering if we shouldn't look at it population based on housing 
and just look at establishments on employment, but I think maybe it needs some more staff time on this and maybe just take that under consideration. Director Holan, if you have 30 seconds, if you'd like it. I'll take every second. Literally you, 30 Chairman. seconds, literally. Uh, I think the issue, that, that one of the issues that really is uh, driving this is your, your local zoning laws and in, in providing where, where you can and cannot build. You're also covered by federal, federal and state uh, issues concerning hazardous waste sites. So I think that that's, uh, that should be one of the drivers uh, in understanding uh, how, we, how we move forward in reducing uh, uh, hazardous um, uh, uh, sites f uh, to prevent uh, development. It's just that simple. We've got lots of examples, Rocky, Rocky Flats, beep, Rocky beep, Mountain Ar beep, 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 Arsenal, beep, all of beep. which contributed to hazardous uh, exposures. So we are out of time, so we are going to consider F not to be resolved. We are going to continue the conversation on F at our next meeting. Director Pfeiffer. To any housekeeping regarding cancellation of meetings you want to announce? Meetings. Housekeeping meetings. on cancellations. Executive Director Shuffle. Well, we were going to send out an email tomorrow, but... <laughs> That's okay. And still will. And still will. That's right. Um, for June, um, RTC, the board, and finance and budget meetings uh, will be canceled. RTC, the board, and finance and budget. So you don't have a meeting until July, so. <laughs> So at 6.01, we are adjourned. Too. Tim, I'm going to stop sharing. And if you need a parking pass, come and see me. And if you would, please take out your name tent. Thank you.